Okay, so uh, so everybody, welcome to this uh, uh, UBS CFEM uh, AI and data analytics seminar. I'm really happy to have Ernest Chan with us. We've been chatting a little bit, and he kind of reminded me of his trajectory: sort of a PhD at Cornell, then working at IBM, then uh, then writing a book uh, on quantitative strategies, and and you're, you're developing your own algorithmic business which he then did with the hedge fund. And now he's uh, he started a, a new company, uh, Predict Now. And, um, and today he's gonna be talking to us uh, about conditional portfolio optimization, a topic that, uh, that is re really interesting to all of us because uh, we're always uh, hungry for uh, more portfolio optimization beyond your, your mean variance. And, and, uh, and I think this is gonna be a very exciting talk. So. Ernest, thank you for coming, and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me, Sasha. Great to be here, um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming to this uh, webinar. Um, so let's set up the problem um, first. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm sure that many of you have um, heard of portfolio optimization mainly as a method to uh, find the best um, capital allocation across different components of a portfolio. Now, that portfolio could be a portfolio of stocks, could be a portfolio of futures. In fact, it could be a portfolio of trading strategies or a portfolio of portfolios. It's quite general. So it is this at the highest level a resource allocation uh, method? So the traditional way of doing it, um, you know, actually earned the um, uh, the person who invented it a Nobel Prize. And of course, I was I'm referring to Markowitz, uh, Harry Markowitz. He invented this uh, mean variance optimization. Uh, which is effectively a quadratic optimizer. The only input would be the uh, the average returns of each of the uh, components of the portfolio, as well as the covariance of returns. Now, naturally, the question arose is that, you know, you can, of course, find the most optimal portfolio using these inputs in the past. But who is to say that that portfolio is going to be optimal in the future? Right and and you know every um, investment advisor would would warn you that past performance is no guarantee of future returns and so we we face with a dilemma here now in over the last few decades there are many many attempts to improve over this um, basic portfolio optimization methods you hear about um, risk parity for example you hear about even hierarchical risk parity and you hear about different effort of using machine learning. Uh, to generate expected returns rather than uh, using historical returns as an input to the mean variance method. But effectively, all of these methods uses past historical returns uh, or, or past um, information as an input, and none of which really take into account the problem that I'm going to talk about, which is regime changes. So, you know, and Regime changes, which I'm going to talk shortly, we really means that, well, the market is, is not stationary. It is subject to multiple different regimes, some of which you don't even have a name for. And how could we, we expect that a portfolio that was optimal, let's say in the past one year, if you use one year look back data to optimize it, going to be optimal, not to mention the next year, but the next month. Um, a clear example uh, was, let's say you're trying to apply mean variance optimization in January, 2022, uh, and using one year look back, no doubt your US stock portfolio will be overweight on stocks like GameStop or AMC and so forth. And it will be probably underweight on ExxonMobil. And of course that portfolio will be the worst possible. Uh, it can't be less optimal. Uh, then you know it would probably be less optimal than an equal weighted portfolio going into 2022 when all the high flying stocks of 2021 fell to earth and all the neglected stocks like ExxonMobil became the best performer. So you know regime changes ha has presented one of the main challenge to the traditional uh, portfolio optimization method. And so what we think about you know the way we approach it is how can machine learning help? To deal with this problem, how can machine learning make use of big data? And by big data, I mean all the variables that we can observe across different markets. Uh, let's say you are optimizing a U.S. stock portfolio. Can we look at 
how oil futures behave, how interest rate behave, how macroeconomic variables behave. Take in whatever it is, the current context, and use that information uh, to improve our optimal, uh, optimal portfolio, to improve our results. How do we do that? And that is the main focus of this technique that we uh, invented called conditional portfolio optimization. So I mentioned uh, uh, the main challenge is changing regime. So what exactly do I mean by regimes? And I should first uh, apologize to the, um, to the very quantitative um, uh, practitioner out there that the regime that we are thinking about it's not well defined. <laughs> it's not uh, the typical uh, well defined regime where, oh, you know, we have a, uh, a, a three state model or we have a 10 state model. We don't even have a discrete number of regimes that in our mind. In this model, we don't define exactly what the regime is. We don't even know, we don't even have discrete number of regimes. Um, so, you know, typically when people talk about regime, they're talking about feasible regimes, bull market, bear market, flat market, choppy market, risk on, risk off, inflationary, deflationary. These regimes are well-defined uh, and they are discrete. You can count them, they're countable. And it is you know, hard to predict, right? I mean, if I could predict when the bear market is gonna come or where the bull market will come, uh, portfolio optimization is the last of my worries. I would immediately become a directional futures trader and you know, who cares about a portfolio? Just trade the uh, index futures and you'll be uh, all done. Or if if I can predict exactly when in pi for facility is going to go up, um, I would just trade the VX future and be done with it. There's no need to worry about portfolio. But problem is these kind of feasible regimes are very hard to predict, um, and there's a lot of arbitrage going on that make it. Uh, if you can predict it, it usually the edge erodes pretty quickly. Now there are also hidden regimes. And I know whenever you mention hidden regime, people think, oh, hidden Markov model. No, no, no. We are not even talking about those hidden regimes. We're talking about um, regimes, hidden regimes that you cannot count and you cannot define. For example, um, how do you call a regime where uh, a large family office uh, is liquidating? How do you call a regime where there are a lot of retail traders buying core options on stocks that were mentioned on Reddit? How do you call a regime where you have a war somewhere and oil prices are going up because of that? And at the same time, you have uh, a, you know, a, a lot of um, demand uh, that are pent up demand due to COVID restrictions. You, know, you, you can't even come up with a name to it. And that's clearly not a discrete regime. This is the kind of regime that can only be sort of implicitly defined by a large number of variables, like, oh, high inflation is one variable. Uh, interest rate, certainly another variable. Oil price, is third variable. And maybe there are some discrete variable that you can use for defining it, such as, is there a major war or is there no major war? Is there a pandemic or no pandemic? You know, it, it, it is kind of um, um, a state where we don't know how to define it and there's no discrete number, but you can at least, um, <clears throat> you measure it using a large number of variables. And that is the kind of regime that we are talking about. And that that is the kind of regime that are constantly changing, uh, that ruined uh, all classical methods of optimization. Um, so actually I'm going to skip uh, the, 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 the emphasis on regime, because as I said, that the problem with, with these machines is that it's hard to predict and it is actually not well-defined but they are very useful as a mental model of understanding why optimization fail uh, in finance, uh, as opposed to perhaps a, a toy problem that one studies in the PhD in operation research. <clears throat> and so now uh, when we were uh, thinking about, you know, how, you know, the one of, one of the reasons that we come up with this optimization method is actually because I was, um, I, I was running a hedge fund and we have a trading strategy uh, that has a few parameters like most trading strategies. Um, and we find that this trading strategy uh, work very well under certain market condition and work poorly under others. And we said, well, that is too bad. How do we adapt the parameters of this trading strategies to you know what you we would understand as the regime um and you know you, the typical way that people would do it is let's just use a walk forward optimization you know use a rolling let's say six month period 
and find out the parameters that are work best for this training strategy, generate the highest drop ratio for this training strategy in the last six months and continuously uh, adapt these training parameters um, as this six month period move forward, right? It's a walk forward optimization. The problem uh, with that approach is exactly the same as the portfolio optimization problem because of uh, you're always looking backward and there's no reason why the last six months uh, is the same as the next six months. And usually it isn't. So this walk forward optimization completely doesn't work for us. And so we come up with a way to use machine learning to adapt these parameters. How? Well, first of all, let's to be to be clear, we are looking at a supervised learning problem, right? So you you, you know in a supervised machine learning um, problem, there is always a target variable, usually called a label. So this is the parameter that we wanted to optimize, or in this case, maximize, sharp ratio, let's say. The future, let's say one month sharp ratio of training strategy or the future one month return. We use that as the label for the supervised learning problem. And then the input would be, you know, you know in, in common machine learning parlance, the features or predictors or the regressors, if you are a linear regression person, um, and that would be all these market and macroeconomic variables that measure the current regime. As I said, the regime is undefined. So we just need a lot of variables to capture aspects of it. But what is most interesting is that we also add to this feature factor, the strategy parameters. And that is something that I haven't seen people use. So that is uh, kind of intriguing that you have a feature factor that part of it is determined by the environment, the market. And part of it is what we call control variables. Those are the uh, features that the human can change, the, the, the trader can change. And combining the two form an input to this supervised learning algorithm. And obviously, um, if you have, let's say, 10 years of data, all these, uh, you know, uh, the daily values of these macroeconomic variables are defined by the environment. But on each day, you can potentially have millions of combinations of these um, control variables, uh, these parameters that you define. So the data set, the, the training data set can actually be enormous for a simple problem like that. And so, but assuming that somehow you are able to um, format this data and train a um, machine learning algorithm, whether it's a neural network or a gradient boosted entry, that doesn't matter really. It's just whatever a regression algorithm that you can, you can put your hands on. You train this model with all this enormous amount of data. And then when it comes time to actual optimization, all you need to do, and I put that in quote, quote, all you need to do is to do an exhaustive search of a various combination of these parameters uh, and find a set that give you the maximum sharp ratio. And that's it. So that's the gist of a, a precursor to conditional portfolio optimization. We call that conditional parameter optimization. Now, um, a simple training strategy, a simple example might illustrate better. You have a Bollinger Japan mean reversion strategy on a, a pair of uh, ETF. And uh, one of the parameters is the hedge ratio, namely how many shares of GDX to trade versus a share of GLD. Another parameter might be the entry threshold of the Red Bull in Japan, meaning at how many multiples of the moving standard deviation are you going to enter into this mean voting strategy. And then, of course, another variable could be another parameter might be the look back to compute the moving standard deviation and moving average, right? So free parameter optimization, very a simple model, toy strategy. And um, the feature table will be will look like this. So as I said, there are all these so-called market features, you know, money flow on the GLD ETF, money flow on GDX, um, the, the uh, you know, technical indicators on GLD, technical indicators on GDX and so forth. You can have hundreds of them, as many as you like. And then you have these variables, the three parameters that I just defined, the, the hedge ratio, the entry threshold and the look back. And together, these are called control features and these are called market features. Together, they form one row, one sample, for input into your training. And if you change the control variables or the parameters slightly, you will get, um, you know, let's say look back going from 30 to 60, you get another sample. You can see that you, you know, this is, 
you don't suffer from a lack of data. You suffer from too much data in this problem. But that's OK. Uh, we'll figure out how to deal with that um, uh, later. Uh, but actually, I, I forgot to mention, please feel free to ask any questions um, while I'm speaking uh, on the chat window. You know, I'm happy to answer it uh, in real time uh, instead of waiting to the end, because usually nobody remember what the question is when, if you wait until the end. So please feel yeah, free. Uh, you can use the Q&A for that. So yeah. just that, that's what we're. Great, great, thank you. Yeah, OK. so. Um, all right, so that is a um, you know that what we 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 come up with as a way to optimize parameters using machine learning, and we had some success with that. And then what we thought is, wait a minute, um, a portfolio, a capital allocation on a portfolio is just a bigger version of this parameter optimization because um, you know you, you know you can think of the capital allocation of this component of a portfolio as just a whole bunch of trading parameters, right? And so, you know, this method we thought can be applied to portfolio uh, optimization as well. Although instead of three parameters, you might now have hundreds or even thousands of parameters to optimize. You, you got a much bigger problem. You get even higher dimensional problem to deal with, but conceptually it's the same as parameter optimization. So. Let's see how we can uh, use apply this method to this larger problem. Now, I, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, there are these already traditional methods, um, risk parity, minimum variance, uh, and maximum sharp. When I say macros, I meant, I meant maximum sharp, uh, looking at the tangency portfolio. These are methods that do not use machine learning. And these are all the solutions that happen to fall on um, the efficient frontier. OK. so. The common theme of all these classical portfolio optimization methods, as I mentioned, is that they use past returns and covariance of returns as input only. None of them take into account the current market condition. They do not take into account technical indicators. They do not take into account fundamental indicators. They do not even take into account macroeconomic indicators, right? They, they, they could not care about all these variables that measure the current market. So, Obviously, they are unable to adapt to the regime. So what do we do? Well, what we do is that we use the same method as we, um, uh, we did up, that we applied to parameter optimization to tackle this problem. We use big data uh, for the input as the input features. Um, we use implicit prediction of hidden regimes. We do not explicitly predict a regime before we go on, and we look for the portfolio uh, that is optimal under the current market condition, not the, the optimal portfolio that was optimal in the last six months as a, um, uh, you know, as, as a solution of this um, uh, optimization. So, we have a couple questions from the Q&A. Um, um, the first one is, are the labels obtained using simulation? So, or are you looking forward? I, I'm, I'm not sure. No, no. So um, for each hypothetical um, portfolio, I mean, typically the portfolio manager present a portfolio. Let's say they want to long this 10 stock and short this 10 stocks, right? So then the tickers of this portfolio are already defined. We are not trying to suggest what stock you should buy and what stock you should short. You define that already as a portfolio manager. So the only freedom we have is how much capital, how much weight we should apply to each of these stocks. And so given a particular hypothetical um, allocation, capital allocation, you get a realized return going forward. So it's not a simulation because based on market data, you would know exactly given this particular capital allocation and this portfolio, what would be the future uh, forward you know, one month sharp ratio or the forward one month return. So it's not um, it's not uh, a simulation per se, uh, but the portfolio capital allocation itself, of course, uh, is a is a proposal, right? You, you you know we try different proposal, and given a particular proposal, the return can be computed from actual market data. So it's not really a simulation. Um, and another related question we have is, um, does that mean with each set of control variables, we need to rerun the backtest to generate the labels? That's right. 
in the in the context of a trading strategy, that is exactly what you have to do. But of course, in the context of a portfolio optimization, it's fairly easy because uh, we are just holding these positions with this capital. So it's fairly easy to say, oh, if I change the capital allocation, what is going to be the return or the sub ratio of this portfolio? Easy, just you know, do another dot made dot um, product, and and out comes the uh, the future sharp ratio of future returns, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um. So um. Now um. At this point, maybe I'll talk a little bit about what features to use. So you know, essentially, the features can be anything. Uh, we can use any sort of time series feature, and it is important to emphasize that we do not use cross-sectional features in this method. We do not care about the, let's say the um, particular characteristic of each stock in the portfolio. We don't care about their earnings. We don't care about their 10 day return. We don't care about their 30 day volatility. It's completely different from the traditional optimization method. Uh, let's say mean variance, because in mean variance, the cross-sectional features of the components are paramount. You know that you 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 need to know the mean return. You need to know the covariance return. Whereas in this method, we don't care at all these cross-sectional features. What we care is the characteristic of the portfolio as a whole, or the characteristic of the market regime as a whole. Things that measure, for example, the um, the farmer fans factors, and things that measure the um, the implied volatility of the index. Things that measure um, whether oil prices are going up, things that measure whether interest rate is going up. So these are these global features that we use. We use no cross-sectional features. Now it might seem strange that um, you know how it is possible that you can ignore the particular characteristics of the component and achieve optimal portfolio, but let's think about it. Uh, going back again several decades ago. Um, David, uh, Eugene Farmer and David French came up with the Farmer French three factor model, right? So, if you remember, the Farmer French three factor model says you know, you have market return, you have the outperformance of the value over growth stocks, and the outperformance of small cap over uh, large cap stocks. Just these three returns can explain a large part of any portfolio's return. It's, uh, that's what they call the Farmer French factor model. Now I emphasize the, the term explain. It does not, it was not meant to be a predictive model. The farmer French model is an explanatory model because this is a, a linear model that regresses the return of a portfolio versus their contemporaneous factors. There's no predictive uh, component to it. And supposedly it has a good R square. So at least as an explanation, it's pretty good. Now, but what if we run the factors in a predictive manner? We lack the factors one period so that we use contemporary factors to predict the future one period uh, portfolio return, let's say. So that make it into predictive model. Um, and at least conceptually, that's what we are doing, right? So we are using contemporaneous factor and feed it into a machine learning model to try to predict the next period return or sharp ratio. Conceptually, it's the same. Now, of course, we use a lot more factors, hundreds of them, whereas Farmer French, of course, uses three factor or five factor. But conceptually, it's the same thing. We use a nonlinear model, a machine learning model, and Farmer French uses a simple linear regression model. But that's just a matter of complexity. It's not a matter of principle. The principle is the same. But the problem is the Farmer French predictive model has very bad R square. I tried, I actually used that as a homework exercise for my master of financial engineering class at Northwestern. And everybody got a very bad R square. They were very depressed for a day because they thought they did something wrong in their homework, but they didn't, it was correct. It was a terrible model for prediction, not a very a good model for explanation, but a terrible model for prediction. So can machine learning improve this prediction? Can more factors improve this prediction? Perhaps it can, perhaps you can. But the interesting thing is it doesn't have to. And that is one of the insight we gain from, from this uh, technique is that because our objective is not predicting returns per se, it is to rank returns 
in an optimization. You do not need to make predictions very accurately. And for example, you know, if you can say, if you say that, hey, here, um, <clears throat> Uh, allocation of 20% to uh, Google and 60% to Microsoft and 20% to Apple, let's say generate an expected uh, sharp ratio of um, one for the next 30 days. Uh, and um, on the other hand, a different allocation of 25%, 60%, 50% generated expected sharp ratio of 0.5 uh, in the next period. You know, and the, we real, realize sharp ratio could be, hey, negative one versus negative three. It's not only is the magnitude wrong, but the sign could be completely wrong in the prediction. And yet, as long as the order of the predicted outcome remain correct, we are in business because you only need to pick the most, the highest rank um, sharp ratio, the portfolio with the highest rank sharp ratio to be the optimal portfolio. So. You you might have heard uh, another paper uh, published in 2020 uh, that is along the similar lines. I can't remember the name of that paper right now, but it will be a reference in our, in our upcoming white paper. But essentially, ranking uh, in most financial applications are more important than actual regression or prediction. And that can be applied to portfolio optimization too. We only need to be able to rank different capital allocations correctly in order to accomplish optimization. And that is something that traditional um, classical uh, optimization method did not um, consider. Now, you know, there have been, as I mentioned earlier, many attempts in using machine learning uh, for portfolio optimization, right? There's, there are many attempts, but typically what those attempts try to do is, you know, they create a machine learning model to predict the cross-sectional returns of the component. Hey, Google, likely to have 1% return. <clears throat> Microsoft might have minus 3% return and Apple is going to have 5% return in the next month. That would be the outcome of the traditional uh, machine learning alpha model. The problem with using that in the optimization is that, you know, unless this return prediction are accurate, the magnitude and the sign are accurate, uh, it, it results in a garbage in garbage out situation. If you are had a large error bar in this kind of return prediction and using that as an input to the quadratic optimizer result in a portfolio that is also far from optimal. It is not very error tolerant. The quadratic optimizers, uh, as many, many books have written, have said, for example, um, Professor Marcus Lopatri Prado's book has uh, outlined some of the problem. Professor Andrew Eng's uh, book. Uh, he used to teach at Columbia. I think now he's at Blackwell had listed numerous problems. And the main problem is the instability of the quadratic optimizer. Any error in the expected return generate hugely different portfolio. That's very, it's very unstable, uh, particularly because you have to invert the covariance matrix. But the CPO method kind of sidestep all of that. We don't even require any cross-sectional feature. We don't require any returns as an input, not to mention ex, you know, an alpha model that predict returns. We don't care any of that. Our, our intellectual um, godfather is really the Fermer fan three-factor model, which does not consider any cross-sectional information at all. And so by doing that and combining with the notion that ranking is more important than prediction or regression, uh, we come up with uh, an optimal solution that is much more stable against errors in any sort of uh, step in the program. You know, machine learning is not very precise to be frank. If anyone who has tried chat GPT could, could testify to that, it's not very precise <laughs> despite all the um, enthusiasm about it. But we are, but using this particular method, we are able to tolerate tremendous errors in machine learning prediction because of ranking. And that is, I think the, uh, one of the, um, uh, the, the insight that we gained from uh, trying this method. <clears throat> so, um, uh, so you know, this slide essentially uh, basically say the same thing uh, as what, what I just said. Uh, now here I have, a, I think there's a question. Let me answer that before I go on to some of the, the numbers. Um, question is, 
my understanding of the GameStop phenomenon is that it's a lot of behavioral finance. Um, yes, indeed. Um, CPU methods um, robust against similar type of behavioral finance. Okay, so that's a very interesting question. So um, even though the cause of the GameStop phenomenon uh, might be behavioral finance, however, um, the effect of that kind of behavior can be measured using certain familiar um, market metrics. One example would be the net delta of options buying activities. And that is actually one of the features we use. Um, it's not a secret or anything because we actually write a blog post on it. There are measures of um, how much buying of uh, core options uh, in the market. Uh, that is an indication of how much, uh, uh, you know, what, what, what's the sort of the, um, the manic level of retail investor. And that is one of the, the metric that, that goes into this, um, this CPO model as one of the feature. So we are taking into account that, except that we don't use uh, anything uh, that is the core cause of the phenomenon. You know, we use the, the effect of that phenomenon as an input. So another question is, um, do you recommend historical ranking of returns and input features? Um, <clears throat> I'm actually not completely sure um, what historical ranking of returns. Um, do you mean uh, ranking of cross-sectional returns of the of the components? Um, so I'm not completely sure. Uh, I understand the um, the question, but maybe maybe we can leave it uh, till the end if we have more time to consider it. Okay, so um, let's look at some concrete. Um, uh, results, you know, we apply to an unconstrained optimization of an S&P 500 portfolio over uh, 10 years. The out sample result is satisfactory. Um, it does beat the Markowitz method uh, three times in terms of sharp ratio. Um, we apply it to a crypto portfolio of eight uh, cryptocurrencies. We are allowed to short if value as long. And again, this is an unconstrained optimization. It also outperformed the mean variance um, method. Um, we apply it to a so this crypto portfolio. Were you using some features of you know some uh, crypto features or, or that were we tried, yeah we tried both blockchain or or was it a simple were, were you just looking at uh, I don't know macroeconomic data or like yeah we, we actually tried both we have crypto features that are generated for market microstructure uh, variables um, and uh, actually they underperform. The traditional uh, market features that we use on traditional assets, which is a surprise to us, uh, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, we also um, uh, look at a, um, a, a Canadian ETF, um, you know, it's a um, prospe prospective client of ours, uh, Evolve ETF. They created a metaverse ETF, mesh ETF that uh, hold. 24 US stocks that has something to do with the metaverse. And in this case, it's a constrained optimization. So you can only allocate from 0.5% to 10% to each component. And with that, we have a out of sample testing period that um, straddles the bull in the bear market, you know, middle, uh, you know, August of 2021 to July of 2022. And you can see that comparing with all these other methods, for example, uh, if you just use the naive equal weight allocation, you know, you get a very bad return, nine, minus 29%. And if you use mean variance optimization, this is kind of a good example of what was optimal in the past can be very unoptimal in the future. It actually performed worse than the equal weight method because of the regime change. And the mean val minimum variance portfolio or minimum volatility portfolio performed much better um, but of course, the CPO method performed better because in 2021, the CPO method was able to allocate more weight to growth stocks, whereas in the, um, or, or actually larger cap stock, whereas it allocate less capital to um, large caps, uh, sorry, uh, it allocate 
more capital to small cap stock in 2021 and more capital to large cap stock in 2022. So it was able to beat the minimum variance portfolio in 2021 and was able to beat the market risk portfolio in 2022. Uh, so it is important to understand that the CPO method does not always outperform classical method in any period. If you take any one year, you say, oh, wait, you know, this underperform markets. What are you talking about? Or, hey, look at this period. You underperform the minimum variance portfolio. But the problem is the whole point of CBO is that it's adaptive. So, you, you know, in the beginning of a test period, you have to choose one method in the classical method. Are you going to choose maximum sharp? Or are you going to choose minimum volatility? Or are you going to choose equal weight? Once you fix on the, that, that method, that's what you're going to suffer, whether it's bull market or, or bear market. Whereas for CBO, it is not fixed. It is adaptive. So it was able to outperform some methods um, in some period. And on the on the average, it, it outperforms um, all these classical methods over the long term because it was able to adapt to the market regime. Uh, un unlike the other ones. So, so I have a couple yes. new questions related to transaction costs. So people want to, one question that ask, uh, can you explain what the turnover is? And uh, if you and the other question is, do you account for commissions? Um, essentially, they're twice they're similar questions. Yes. So um, these I should emphasize that these um, um, performance number do not take into account transaction costs. And the reason is that, first of all, the um, rebalance period is um, one month. And secondly, um, the existing portfolio also has transaction costs. So it's not like if I don't apply this method, they suffer no transaction costs. They do, because these are actively traded portfolio. Even though it's an ETF, it's an actively managed ETF. So they prune the position, they add new stocks every month. So there are transaction costs intrinsic to the portfolio. All we do is to recommend that, hey, when you buy this stock, buy more. Or when you, when you buy the other stock, buy less. So the transaction costs that we incur are kind of part of what they would normally incur anyway. It's not in addition to what they incur. That's why we don't uh, you know, consider transaction costs in this kind of optimization. So you, you the weights of the CPO don't move extremely dramatically from, I, I guess an equal weight is probably the least, the one that's gonna move around the least, but it does require rebalancing. When one stock goes up, it needs to be sold and, and vice versa. Yes. But the and CPO, uh, I guess the volatility of your weights is not out of control, like from one month to the other, it's not completely different, is it? That's or right. For this particular portfolio, equal weights actually doesn't mean that you hold the same set of stock with the same capital month after month. Because like I said, this is an actively managed portfolio. So every month, theoretically, they could get rid of half the portfolio and buy another half of the portfolio completely new stocks. When I say equal weight, it just means that in the beginning of that month, all these new stocks positions have equal weight. It does not mean that the same stock positions are held month after month uh, and rebalance to the equal weight until the end of time, right? So there is already a lot, a, a major amount of transaction costs every month that is embedded in forming this portfolio. We did not actually add further to that transaction. We only asked them, hey, instead of equal weight, buy more of this or less of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so um, just to illustrate that this method also work uh, on a portfolio of strat trading strategies in instead of just stocks, uh, we have a client that is called S WSG Market. It's a Forex uh, hedge fund. They manage seven trading strategies in that portfolio. So the constraint of our um, optimization is that each strategy weight can be between 0% to 40%. We cannot short a strategy, in other words. And again, we improve the sharp ratio in an out of sample test. But most importantly, um, we actually deploy this optimization technique live on the portfolio starting July 2022. And so far, uh, the report 
that we received said that we have added about 60 basis points a month to their portfolio compared to their existing um, allocation method. Um, <clears throat> finally, I want, I want to talk about a particular um, portfolio given to us by his private client. It, this portfolio is a stock portfolio. I would call that a tax stock portfolio because it's all uh, tax stocks and the constraint is 0% to 25% on each stock. But there's one flexibility that we have. And that is we can allocate up to 50% of that portfolio in cash. And because of that flexibility, we are able to generate positive return over the same amount of sample period as the MASH ETF, which is a surprise because this is tax stock. It's supposed to crash very badly in 2022. But fortunately, our method was allocating 50% of the portfolio to cash during that period. And it rescued the portfolio uh, from a negative return over this one year um, out of sample test. <clears throat> so so um, I've got another question. And um, so the question is, basically people are curious about the details, uh, you know, so they're asking, how are we modeling the market regimes? For example, what prediction variable is used? What type of machine learning algorithm do we use so I, I mean i guess it's it's a question about like reproducibility like how do, is it in your paper uh you know do we do you talk specifically about wh wh where's the magic sauce is it in the choice of the of the variables is it in the in the you know the the machine learning algorithm that's used um you know i, I suppose that uh that we're, we're curious here about reproducibility and like wh what are the parts that I think you I guess that you you can easily uh, just give away and what parts are you know I, I guess after all these are all successes you've had with clients so there's maybe some proprietary information so I guess we're kind of curious where where what are the things you you want to give away and what are the things where where there's something proprietary yes yeah, so um Certainly the input features are important and we actually have numerous blog posts uh, describing what kind of features we use. One of which, as I explained earlier, is what's called a net delta of options um, in the market. You know, are people aggressively buying call options uh, to bet on end of day reversal of the market, such as what happened with GameStop and so forth. Uh, others are simply, you know, in pie volatility or uh, uh, the returns of various uh, futures. Um, and, you know, there, there are numerous of them. And, you know, we have described not the exact formula of how to compute them, but give a very strong flavor of what they are. So they are no, no secrets, but of course to engineer them correctly requires some, you know, care is the concept it's not so 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 out uh, outlandish or innovative, but you know it's just requires a, a lot of engineering detail uh, to create those features. And we have disclosed the high level description of them on our many blog posts on our website. Um, in terms of the um, machine learning algorithm, that's the least proprietary. I can tell you that we use um, gradient boots as decision tree and a forest of them, and that's that. That's that. Does it mean that neural network or deep learning does work? No, we just haven't got around to try them. So if you you can perhaps you know outperform our method if you are using more advanced machine learning technique. But we thought that uh, the key of this method is not so much the machine learning algorithm, but the different pieces that are put together. Um, in terms of market regime, as I said, we didn't actually. Um, in my first apology to the uh, more quantitative practitioner here, we actually don't define the regime. We don't even know uh, that there are discrete number of regimes. The regime prediction is implicit. That is to say, we are using these hundreds of features to represent the state of the market, to the, the, the regime, if you like. But instead of giving a name to it, we just say, oh, hey, currently the market regime is the fix at 16 the oil price at whatever, $50 uh, per barrel, the um, interest rate is at 4.75% and so on and so forth. So we don't have a name for that regime. We define that regime by giving you 180 numbers. And here, take it. This is our current regime. 
So there's no prediction. We are just, uh, there's no modern. It's just plain vanilla, 180 features. That's the regime. Um, so and in yeah. an abstract way, you're, you're building a function that takes X, uh, X's that are control variable, X's that are market environments, and then you construct a Y, which is a response, maybe a sharp ratio. And, yes. then, and then you fit this function F over many scenarios of the control variable for each given market state. And then once this function is defined, I guess it's a tree or whatever it, it, the machine learning technique is, then you input your, your state of the market and that, and how, but then your question, your output should be your control variable, right? Or it's your- No, the, um, yes. So the, the label of the supervised learning algorithm is what you want to maximize. Let's say sharp ratio. Yeah, uh, thirty day forward sharp ratio, and then you know, and and since you have many proposal portfolio, right? You you can have one hundred million proposal portfolio. Everyone you feed it into this uh, predictive formula, and you get a sharp ratio. And you say, oh well, I like the best sharp ratio, of course. And so you say, okay, pro proposal one hundred and fifty seven has the highest sharp ratio. I like that proposal portfolio and look at that proposal portfolio. Oh, it says allocating 5% to Google, 10% to Microsoft and so forth. And that's, that's the resulting, that's the answer you're looking for. 5% Google and 10% Microsoft and so forth. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and um, so the, so the only secret sauce I might say that we don't disclose is, as I said, you know, you might have, a hundred million proposal portfolios. In fact, you could have infinite number. I mean, let's say you have a 500 stock portfolio and you allow cash. It is a 500 dimensional space that you have to search in. Um, and you, know, you, can, you can put a grid on this 500 dimensional space uh, to and try them all. You know, try every proposal portfolio in this 500 dimensional space. Obviously it will be very difficult. You know, we've been possible. So one of the 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 algorithm that we develop is where in this high dimensional space do we search? That is actually the the key to solving this problem. Which we this that's the secret sauce. <laughs> so, so everything else is quite plain, uh, as I explained. You know, that's that it has uh, antecedents in the in the uh, literature, right? Okay, um, so we have another question about uh, that asks how big of a portfolio universe, asset universe have you used? Or what, what is the biggest that's feasible? Well, the biggest we have um, uh, tried so far is the toy strategy, which is the first one, it's the S&P 500. Um, now, but I should say that the complexity of the problem does not scale linearly with the number of assets. And that is why I said the secret sauce, right? If, it, if we don't have that particular trick of sampling this high dimensional space, it would grow much you know, exponentially with the number of assets. Essentially, you are, every extra asset add a new dimension to the space, right? So instead of 500 uh, uh, dimension, if you have, 501 stocks, you're gonna have 501 dimension space. So it grow exponentially the number of um, uh, 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 samples. But the pop, but in our method, it actually doesn't grow like that. It grows um, something like the um, the square root of of the number of assets. So it's quite uh, manageable. Okay. Well, another that. thing that has been growing exponentially is the number of questions in our Q and A. So. <laughs> Maybe I'll take a, a, a little break from asking you questions and let you finish your talk and then we'll see uh, how many we have time for. Okay, sounds good, sounds good, yeah. Um, actually, I'm uh, about to, oh yeah, let me wrap up this particular use case because it's interesting. Um, well, I mean, first of all, the comparative equity curve, everybody like to look at that. And of course, uh, I wouldn't be displaying this curve if C CPO doesn't have the the best you know, uh, performance overall in the equity curve. But the next 
equity curve that is the next highest performing is embarrassingly the equal weight allocation. <laughs> so <laughs> many decades of financial research come up with uh, some of this worst equity curve possible when equal weight is uh, almost as good as uh, CPO. <laughs> so, um, but the next graph is actually what I'm trying to drive at is the cash allocation. So many um, people that we, we uh, pitch this um, technique to ask, you keep saying that this respond to regime, how do you show us that is this portfolio allocation actually respond to regime correctly? And here is a good example. If we just look at the cash allocation, you can see that you know if you if you imagine that this is a two state cash allocation, either zero or fifty percent. Well, in that case, the pink shaded area are where the cash allocation is at fifty percent. And if you superimpose that on the S and P five hundred index, you see that almost every time there's a big dip in the index, we are uh, in the fifty percent cash. And now, of course, there's a caveat. Um, and up to this point, this is all training data. Up to 2021 July, these are training data. So you say, of course, you overfitted to the past. But the gratifying thing is that in the out of sample data, when the bear market started in 2022, uh, we are also most of the time in cash. And that was what saved the portfolio from a negative return overall. So, um, there are some bells and whistles, namely that you can set your objective function to anything. It doesn't have to be sharp ratio. Uh, unlike the um, traditional portfolio optimization method where basically the objective function has to be either maximum um, sharp ratio or maximum return or minimum uh, variance because of the, you know, they, or it has to be any point on the efficient frontier. That was the traditional classical mean variance technique where, because of the nonlinear nature of our learning algorithm and our optimization algorithm, it can be anything. It can be any nonlinear function of the portfolio can be used as an objective function. Expected shortfall is a popular choice among some of our prospective clients. Um, constraints can be applied. Uh, as I said, uh, you know, certainly weight constraint, but as well as anything that you can, you know, that, are, that is fashionable today, MS, uh, ESG weighting. Uh, or or or, or um, turnover is another popular constraint. Uh, you know, some of you have concern about transaction costs, and indeed, one of um, you know we have a proof of concept going on with MSCI, and indeed, turnover uh, is one of their constraint, uh, important constraint. So, um, so many of these uh, features that we provided, as I said, are time series feature measure various aspect of market, but we do have a bias towards the US market features, right? So um, there we have some European kind of say, hey, how does your feature gonna work on European market? How does your feature gonna work on Japanese market, on Chinese market? Well, the good thing is that our system can accommodate any features that the client can provide. So that's not a constraint. Um, it, you can merge with us without telling us what they are. So that's one of this um, um, sort of this software uh, flexibility. And all that is provided as an API, but that's just sort of the implementation aspect. So I would, uh, you know, I would stop now since we only have five minutes and you know, maybe take care of any other questions that arise. Yeah, sure. Uh, would you rather me read them to you and to, to make it a little bit more uh, interactive or easy? Yeah, sure, please. <laughs> please, please. So, yeah. um, all right, so um, one, the first one I have here is, in your first example, you mentioned allocating to stocks trading at least 1 million in the S&P 500 using 10-year trading with Windows. How do you deal with stocks only recently added to the index um, or stocks whose nature changed over the 10 years, say due to spin off of key operations, that seems to create non stationarity and very short history of data for such stocks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, uh, in, in any portfolio, um, there are, we allow for addition and deletion of component, right? So every time there's a new portfolio, uh, you know, we, we would uh, essentially train the, the model. Um, from scratch, right? So, so every time there's a rebalance of the com portfolio components, we, we have to train a new machine learning model. And in that case, it is not a problem if some of the component stock has short history. 
because when you consider this portfolio history, you know, a, a one of the components that has short history simply means that um, the return of the portfolio prior to the existence of that stock uh, does not include that component, right? You can still compute a portfolio return. So just like the S&P 500 index, you can compute the S&P 500 index return even though the component always changes. Just like SPY, the, the, the spider ETF. You know, anyone can compute the spider ETF return since, I don't know, 1970s, uh, even though many of the stock ceased to exist or many of the stock were recent addition to the index. Because at the portfolio level, the return can be computed just by assigning zero weight to those stock that didn't exist prior to a certain date. It was not a problem. And the key benefit of this particular technique as opposed to the Markowitz technique is that in Markowitz, you will have a hard time doing that because you will, um, you know, some of this stock will have less, as you said, you know, maybe a few days of returns. How do you compute the expected return if you only have a few days of assistance? But for us, we don't care about return. We don't care about any cross section features. What we care is the time series features. We don't use stock returns component as input to the algorithm at all. So this is actually much less of a problem to our method as opposed to the Markowitz uh, method. Okay. Um, so the next question is, um, so the regime changing is described by the weighting of the factors. If regimes changes, uh, the weightings of the factors also change significantly in this sense. I'm yes. not sure. I understand the yeah, question. you can say that. Um, yes, I mean the factors. For example, if you consider um, the um, <clears throat> HML, Farmer-French HML factor as an input, right? So regime change would mean that the HML factor goes from positive to negative. People suddenly love grow stock, then HML factor will become negative. So that would be one example of a regime change. But as I said, our regime is not defined by one variable, but it's defined by 180 variables. So I give you the entire 180 factor to you to say, hey, he, he's the regime. You know, it's not just the fact that value goes to growth or small cap become out of favor and large cap become in favor. It is the totality of the measurements of the current state yeah. of growth. But, but thinking about, you know, a single factor or three factors kind of helps simplify it. So. That's right. So if we're thinking of this, um, you know, Fama French model, are you thinking of your three factors being the re the three returns over the last 24 hours? And then based on these three returns, you would um, you would maximize the sharp ratio over, you know, over the next week or month or it's, it, it seems like you know, the, these daily returns of uh, high minus low and so on, they fluctuate all over the place, right? Or, right, right. Or well, it, you know, maybe Fama and French did monthly returns, I think. So last month's growth, high minus low, would be your main input to decide what your weights in, you know, all 500 stocks, let's say, of the S&P 500 are? Yes, yeah, so, um, no, that's a good point. Um, you know, a lot of these um, features are uh, simply measurements at different time frames. So as you pointed out, for example, HML factor, you can measure it daily, you can measure it monthly, you can measure it quarterly. And yeah. hey, why not put, put all three at three different features? We, we have no idea which one is important to define the regime. Is the market looking at one day or is it market looking at one month? We don't know. Throw it all in, let the machine learning algorithm decide. So all these factors are um, thrown into a machine learning algorithm. You can apply feature selection and so forth to eliminate those that have no significance in predicting the outcome of this portfolio. And so you only have a, um, the top ranked features that are actually useful in predicting the future of this portfolio. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right, I, uh, next question is, uh, is this problem formulation a type of cost sensitive classification? I'm not sure I understand it. But... Yeah, ne neither do I. Yeah, I actually, I don't know what concept cost sensitive classification. It's not quite a classification problem. Yeah. Um, although I guess you can reframe it that way, because as I said, 
What's important is ranking. It's not really regression, but it's ranking. So as I will reference this popular paper that, that talk about ranking in portfolio construction, you can in principle um, use a classification model um, to say, you know, which portfolio has a higher rank. So yes, it, this can be reframed as a classification problem. Um, if that's okay. what you mean, but I don't know what a cost sensitive classification is. The, the next question is relevant to this ranking. They ask, do you pick just one optimal portfolio or can you use an average over N best portfolios in an ensemble? Yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question. I'm going to tell my researcher to look into that <laughs> because um, yeah, currently we only pick one, uh, but yes, in principle, you know, why only use one, right? I mean, uh, you know, certainly an ensemble seem to give a more stable um, uh, selection, but thank you for that question. Yeah, we, we pride ourselves on having a smart <laughs> audience that gives you good ideas. <laughs> That's right. All right. Yeah. So the next one, um, for training, if you have 1 million combinations of portfolios, are you training the model on 1 million combinations on each day of historical data? In principle, yes, yes. Um, uh, that's right. Yes, you you have to have um, um, yes. Every day you would have one million rows of training data. If you are actually you know uh, have one million different combinations. Yes, you are exactly right. Fortunately, because of our secret sauce, we don't have to do that. Otherwise, it will be require a lot of computational power. Yeah. Okay, and well, uh, let's ah. I was gonna. There's one more question that popped up. If a regime is a vector of 180 variables and another regime is another such vector, then what metric do you use to quantify the distance between regimes? Can you tell the regime has changed or not? Well, like I said, we don't, um, this is not a two step problem. I know that the moment I mention regime, there will be this confusion. Maybe in the future version of this talk, I'm not going to spend too much time on regime because. The, the idea is that we directly use this feature factor to predict the performance of a portfolio. We don't use that to predict a regime and then condition on that particular regime what is the probability distribution of the portfolio outcome. It's not a two-step process, unlike perhaps a hidden Markov model or one of those latent variable models. So um, I, I think, you know, in a future version of this talk, I'm gonna skip that completely perhaps because this that does cause confusion. This, we don't actually identify the regime first and then condition on that regime what's the distribution of returns or sharp ratio uh, is. Okay, but maybe th that question still, like let's say that, you know, in uh, 1973, uh, the exact same 100 variables or they were extremely close to what they are today. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you've, you've calibrated this, uh, you know, this machine learning algorithm, you would expect that, expect that because your current regime is close to January 3rd, 1973, that somehow our, the weight would be the same, right? Or, or that it would be That's right. That's right. We, we, well, we, we don't necessarily know the rate is the same. It depends on how other portfolio capital allocation um, uh, uh, perform uh, in the ex expected to perform, but certainly the expected return would be similar to what happened in 1973 uh, if we had included a lot of that training sample in 1973. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and well, the last question, I'm, I'm gonna sort of join it and uh, they just want to say great presentation and thanks for, for a really interesting talk. Thank you, thank you. Glad to be uh, here. Yeah, thank you very much.